My name is Elisa McCall and I am a staff scientist and the director of conservation outreach at Polar Bears International. I did my master's degree on the Western Hudson Bay polar bear population under Dr. Andy DeRoche at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And so I've been studying these polar bears for about five years now uh, and really enjoy coming up every fall to see them again. I'm Steve Amstrup. I'm the chief scientist of Polar Bears International and I've been working for PBI for about five years. Prior to working for PBI, I was in charge of polar bear research for the U.S. federal government in Alaska. And I studied polar bears in Alaska for over 30 years. Uh, it was the work of our lab in Alaska that resulted in having polar bears listed as a threatened species on the Endangered Species Act in 2008. Polar bears mate out on the sea ice in the springtime, but the females don't actually implant that fertilized egg until later in the fall when they know that there's enough body fat on their bodies. If their body is able to go through a pregnancy, they will enter a den in the fall. That fertilized egg will implant, they'll become pregnant, and a couple months later, they'll give birth to between one and three, but most often one or two cubs, about the size of a guinea pig each. Uh, so this mom will nurse the cubs in her den for a couple months. The cubs grow rapidly, and by the time they exit the den a couple months later, the cubs could be around 20 pounds or so, a little less, a little more, depending on how many are, are in the litter. They'll go out to the sea ice and they'll start eating. And for the Western Hudson Bay polar bear moms, they can go up to eight months without having a meal. So it's an incredibly long time before they eat again. So they need to have a lot of body fat if they're going to go through a pregnancy. Now, once there's been cubs born and the family's out on the ice, uh, mom will raise the cubs for approximately two years, two and a half years. Uh, she'll be teaching them how to hunt. They'll start helping her the older they get. And then they'll be weaned um, in about two and a half years and they'll go out on their own at which point they're called sub-adults. And what we're seeing in some populations that are nutritionally stressed is that the moms are just, or the females are not able to become moms because they're not getting big enough, they're not getting that body fat, uh, so they're either not able to produce cubs and that really high fat milk that they need to nurse or they're simply having fewer cubs overall. And it's really hard to get the cubs uh, from that young stage up to adulthood. And so recruiting these cubs into the population as adults, uh, we are seeing in certain years at least the population is struggling with recruitment. In the western Hudson Bay polar bear population where we're sitting right now, uh, the females enter the dens in the summer when the sea ice completely melts. And so they need to be saving their energy and they will go up to eight months without eating. In other parts of the polar bear's range, so in the higher arctic for example, the females are able to stay out on the sea ice longer and don't need to enter their dens until right before they absolutely have to and so they might only need to go up to four or five months without eating. Uh, the emissions that we're producing as humans are uh, causing this really thickened heat trapping blanket around the earth and it's simply rising the temperatures. Uh, Arctic sea ice is important for polar bears as a platform, but it's also important for the ecosystem as a whole. We have microorganisms growing in the sea ice that feed the other organisms in the ecosystem. It's really the soil of the Arctic, uh, just like we have soil in a forest. This Arctic sea ice is not just your average ice in terms of what it means to the ecosystem. It's also like the Earth's air conditioner. It's reflecting sunlight away and preventing sunlight from being absorbed into the ocean, and it's allowing the entire Earth to help regulate its temperature. So it's really important that we keep it as is for polar bears, but also for people and the rest of the ecosystems. Arctic sea ice loss impacts polar bears uh, by basically equating to a loss of calories. Polar bears depend on sea ice for things like traveling and mating and maybe even denning, but the main point of sea ice for polar bears is access to seals. And seals have the really high calorie uh, fat and blubber that polar bears need to survive. When we lose sea ice, whether it's in uh, the length of time sea ice is around or in the amount of area it covers, polar bears lose access to this high calorie fat. And so basically they're doing the same thing or even more movement with fewer calories. This over time can lead to uh, smaller body sizes and fewer cubs produced and raised into adulthood, overall decreasing the population size of polar bears.
It's often said that as the sea ice goes, so goes the polar bear. But a lot of people don't really understand what that means. The reason that we can say that is because polar bears are really only effective at catching their food from the surface of the ice. As the sea ice disappears earlier or moves away from productive habitats earlier, that forces polar bears to either have to travel farther or uh, to find food, or they become food deprived for longer periods. So the situation that we have here in Hudson Bay is an earlier ice melt in the summer and a later ice, melt, ice freeze up in the fall. And that means a longer period of food deprivation. In other parts of the world, like in the Beaufort Sea, where I did most of my research, it means that the ice is farther offshore over unproductive water for a longer period. In either case, the bottom line is that as the sea ice continues to deteriorate, as there are less and less ice available, there's less and less food available for polar bears. Polar bears will not be able to adapt to climate change in time or become a new species. Polar bears evolved as a species to take advantage of the sea ice habitat and eat their marine prey seals, and this happened over hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions. The way that we're seeing Climate Change Act is happening in decades, and polar bears just are too long-lived of a species, uh, they reproduce way too slowly, they just can't catch up to the changes we're seeing in sea ice. And though we have seen a couple examples of what we call a growler bear, or a polar grizzly hybrid, uh, this really is no solution for the polar bear situation, and we need to protect the Arctic sea ice to protect the polar bears as a species. When scientists talk about adaptation, they're talking about an evolutionary process. Over time, animals respond to changes in their habitats. The changes that are occurring in the sea ice, however, are going so rapidly that we don't believe polar bears can keep pace with it. Polar bears evolved sometime between the last quarter million and million years, and they've spent that whole time figuring out how best to make a living out on the surface of the sea ice. They can't undo that long process in the 50 or 60 years we believe sea ice in this part of the world will continue to exist. One of the things people always want to know is can polar bears just come ashore and make a living on land if the sea ice disappears? And you have to put their energy balance in perspective when you ask that question. Polar bears depend on catching seals from the surface of the sea ice. And these seals are kind of like giant fat pills. They're about 40 or 50 percent fat by body weight. And polar bears have become the largest bears in the world by capitalizing on that fatty, nutritious food. On land, we don't have anything like that. If you look at brown bears, grizzly bears that live along the coast in the Arctic, right adjacent to where the bears live, those brown bears are among the smallest of brown bears all over the world and they live at very low densities. And the reason is because the sources of food on land in the Arctic are just very, very poor if you're a bear. There may be lots of vegetation out here if you're a caribou or if you're a moose, but if you're a bear, there's not very much. And so there's no reason for us to think that we could put whole populations of the largest bears in the world onto a landscape that currently supports only small numbers of small bears. Scientists have shown that there's essentially a linear relationship between global mean temperature and sea ice. So if the temperatures rise, we have less sea ice. Temperatures fall, we could have more sea ice. So if we stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations, that will stabilize global mean temperatures and it will stabilize sea ice. We've shown this in models. It seems to be holding up no matter how far out you push the situation. And recently, it's even been shown that if we have that the relationship between greenhouse gas concentrations and the sea ice is also linear. So we can actually say my activities are generating this many tons of carbon dioxide and that accounts for this much loss of sea ice. If I cut back on that, I can save this much sea ice. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to say, here's where our goals are, here's how we can get there, so let's march forward and do it.